Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Text for this morning, the gospel lesson you've heard, the parable of the talents. Imagining the unimaginable kingdom to come is learning the art of living in what we've been calling the already but not yet reality of God's presence and his work of restoration that is going on even now in this crazy, mixed up, messed up world. By faith in Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, ascension, and promise coming again in glory, the kingdom of God, that's the world put right, has begun already in us. But it is not yet here in all of its fullness. Therefore, these past weeks we have been learning what is important is that we always and ever be ready for that moment when Jesus will come again as he has promised in glory and will make the not yet permanent. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we be ready? Well, two weeks ago we said we needed to practice hopeful waiting. That is, when you see the fig tree putting out its leaves, you know that summer is coming. So also when you see the world literally tearing itself apart at the seams, you know that Jesus is closer now than he ever has been before. Last week we learned to practice watchful waiting. Keep practicing your parousia drills. Both Pastor Tig and Pastor Elliot used that phrase last week to tell us that that little word means the second coming of Jesus. And as I was sitting listening to them preach last week, I thought, you know, that's what we do here every week. We do a second coming drill as we all gather together around the throne and then we join with the angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven and we sing the songs of heaven, holy, holy, holy. In our parable today, Jesus issues a command. Enter into the joy of your master. And while it is certainly a picture of the not yet reality of the unimaginable kingdom to come, it has an already effect on our lives that are lived in the kingdom now. Now it's important to remember that Jesus is talking specifically to his disciples, to his followers, to those who have thrown their lot in with him lock, stock, and barrel. So if you're here this morning and you're not quite sure where you stand with Jesus, you're not sure if you really believe all this Christianity stuff, you're not sure if you're all in or not, folks, this is a great lesson for you to sit back and look around at everybody else and evaluate whether the people who say they believe actually live like it. And of course, it's also an opportunity to consider, why wouldn't you want to be a follower of Jesus in light of the power and the promises that are being offered. And for all of us, it is a moment to step back and simply marvel at the unimaginable kingdom to come. Enter into the joy of your master. Now the old cliche, eat, drink, and be merry, is often cited as a negative way to approach life, and rightly so. Because it, it begs a selfish, self-indulgent lifestyle that ends ultimately in an eternal disaster. But as I was preparing this parable this week, it struck me that Jesus might actually be inviting us into a new way of thinking. That Jesus might actually be commanding us to eat, drink, and be merry in the kingdom now. In other words, to live your life to the fullest, to enjoy the moment, to grab the gusto, to use all the blessings that God has poured into your life. But here's the twist, not selfishly, not self-indulgently, 
but to let your light so shine before all people that they may see your good works. They could see your joyful celebration of life. Even when your circumstances are less than perfect. So that the whole world can see how incredible God is. Enter into the kingdom of your master first by remembering exactly who you are. Now what do I mean? Well, the picture of the parable is clear. There is an owner in this story to whom everything belongs, and he entrusts his property to his servants. Now, there is a little bit of historical cultural translation difficulty here because, first of all, we do not understand that what is happening here is so much more than simply putting money to work in some sort of ancient stock market where hopefully you choose wisely and you get a decent return on the investment. No, these servants are expected to take the master's capital and to get out there and to do something with it. To buy a business and to supervise the work. To buy a plot of land and to cultivate it. To hire workers and to create something new. It's more like what we would call venture capital. Which is, I understand it, the investing of money in a person or in an idea that you think has the potentials and sometimes will yield extraordinary results and sometimes not. Venture capital is money invested in a project in which there is a substantial element of risk. But secondly, we struggle here because a talent is a first century unit of measure for gold or silver, and one talent was the equivalent of approximately 20 years of wages. So that five talents would be what? A hundred years of wages. Now a quick Google search reveals that the median income of Seminole County, Florida is $66,768 as of the last census, and that times 100 would be the five talents in today's money would be what? $6,678,800, and even the one talent is more than a million. Look. You are sons and daughters of the one and only supreme being of the universe who created all things to whom all things belong and to you he has entrusted, well, everything, the whole world and the world to come has been given to us. I mean, take the Apostles' Creed and Luther's explanation to it and think about this with me for just a minute. I mean, I believe that God has given me my body and soul, my eyes, ears, my reason and all my senses, also clothing and shoes, house and home, etc., 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 all that I need to support this body of life and all of this all of this, everything that I have, everything that I ever will have, he gives purely out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me for which it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. Now, not only did God give us the whole planet to manage and to enjoy, 
When we broke it, when we tried to become the owners instead of the servants, God turned around and he purchased and he won us back from sin and death and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death so that we can be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he has risen from the dead and lives in reigns to all eternity and now now he pours his holy spirit into us to create and sustain our faith in jesus he enlightens us with his gifts he makes each one of us new every day forgives all our sins And will, at the last day, raise up my body from the dead and all believers to live forever body and soul in the new heaven and the new earth. People, do you get it? Using a very common, simple financial metaphor, Jesus would remind us today that we have been entrusted with life. And not just lowercase life, but capital life. Eternal life that begins now and will never end. Each according to their ability. Some have more, some have less. But look, it's not random. The one to whom much is given, much more is expected. Now remember, we're talking about followers of Jesus here. This is not commentary on the distribution of wealth in this fallen world. It's simply a way of saying that God knows us so well that he gives us exactly what he knows will give us the best life, what will make us the most productive in his kingdom. First, enter into the joy of your master by remembering that you are sons and daughters of the triune God who entrusts you with your life. And then secondly, by remembering who your master is. The first two servants went off immediately and set to the business of living the life that they had been given. But one of them departed, dug a hole, and buried that life in his backyard. Why? Well, because he dreadfully misjudged the master. I was afraid, he says. And then in a weird little linguistic twist, he starts talking about farming. About sowing seeds which ought to make us think about another parable that Jesus told about a sower where the seed was thrown everywhere, even in places where it was unlikely that there would ever be a harvest on the path and among the weeds and even on the rocks, so that far from being a master who reaps where he does not sow, this is a master who generously sows where he will never be able to reap. The wicked servant is calling the master exploitative, grasping, using the labor of others for his own gain. In his mind, if they made money, the master would come and claim it as his own. And if they lost the money, he would blame and punish them. But if this servant had truly been afraid He would have at least put the master's money in the bank. But in fact, this servant holds the master in contempt. Do you know why? Because he wants to be the owner. I need you to think. You need to think, please. The master is Jesus who has lived the life that we were all supposed to to live, trusting and obeying perfectly, and then he died the death that we all deserved to die. He was cut off from the kingdom of God on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
mean, what did that follower of Jesus named Paul say in the letter that he wrote to the Christians in Rome? He who did not spare his own son, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Robert Kappen is a biblical scholar who's written several books on these parables of Jesus that we've been using in our study. And for this one, he brilliantly imagines a dialogue between the master and this wicked servant who he gives the name Arthur. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but these are primarily Kappen's words. And it begins with the master speaking. That's not really what I'm mad about. Look, Arthur, I invited you into a faith relationship with me. I didn't ask you to make money. I asked you to do business. I entrusted you with what is mine, remember? I invited you to an exercise, to a little pragmatic trust that I meant well for you and that I wouldn't even mind if you took some risks with my gift of life. But what did you do? You decided that you had to be more afraid of me than of the risks. You decided what to do with your life. You played it safe because of some imaginary fear. And so now, instead of having gotten yourself a nice little life as a mayor of at least a small city, now Kappen's trying to make concrete what the reward in the new heaven and the new earth might be like using his imagination instead of getting that all you have is the crummy little excuse for a life that you started with as a matter of fact Arthur you haven't even got that because you know what I'm going to do I'm going to take what I gave you and just for fun to show the outrageousness of grace, I'm going to give it to that guy over there who already has more than he knows what to do with. And do you know why I'm going to do that? First of all, to remind everybody that when I give a gift, grace and forgiveness... I expect you to do business with it, to keep it moving, to forgive others as you are forgiven. See the Lord's Prayer. Not just to keep it to yourself, wrapped up in some napkin, buried in your backyard, some low-risk spiritual life of being religious once a week. But second... I'm going to give your gift to him to show everybody that I never really cared about the results anyway. The gift of grace is not a reward for your hard work or your good behavior. It is a lark. It is a hilariously inequitable largesse. In a word, it is a gift. Don't you see, Arthur? You could have earned a million with the money that I gave you, or you could have earned two cents. In fact, you could have even lost it all doing something risky, and at least that way you would have been a gambler after my own heart. But when you crawl in here and insult me, me, Mr. Risk himself, who while you were still sinners, died on the cross for you. By telling me that you decided that I couldn't be trusted enough for you to gamble on a life lived fully for me, that I was some legalistic type who went only by the books, judgment by law instead of grace, well, dot, dot, dot. Enter into the joy of your master. 
The one who died and rose again to give you hope in the here and now and a future that is beyond your imagination. Remember who you are and remember who your master is and now anticipate that great and glorious day when your master will return. Imagine your conversation standing in the presence of the Lord. I don't know, saying something like, you know, Lord, you died and you rose for me. And you entrusted me with capital life. And I've tried to live it for you, but there was so much more that I could have done because too often I was too timid and I failed to take advantage of all of the opportunities to show your grace and your mercy and your generosity to others. And to each of you, he will say, yes, I know. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. People, you need to remember who you are. You need to remember who your master is and what he has done for you. And now, go humbly and boldly and do business this week with what he has entrusted to you, your life. Amen. Now, the peace that passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in this true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.